All right, well, we'll get started here. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the State of Utah Energy Storage Summer Webinar Series presented by the Department of Energy's Office of Electricity Energy Storage Programs in collaboration with the Utah Governor's Office of Energy Development, Sandia National Laboratories, Pacific Northwest National Laboratories, Mustang Prairie Energy, Quanta Technology, and the University of Utah's Utah Smart Energy Laboratory. My name is Kevin Brooks. I'm the Energy Analytics Manager for the Utah Governor's Office of Energy Development. And uh, we want to extend a special thanks to Dr. Imre Zhuk um, and the Department of Energy's Office of Electricity Energy Storage Programs for providing funding for this webinar series. Today's webinar is being recorded and the recording will be shared with um, the public after the series concludes in August and PDF versions of the today's presentations will be shared after the session uh, later today. Um, if you have any questions, we ask that you hold those questions till the end of the session. There will be a Q&A discussion session um, from 1130 and noon today. Um, at that time, please feel free to uh, unmute uh, yourselves and ask the questions directly, or you can also um, send your questions to me through the chat, um, just privately through the chat, and I'm happy to ask on your behalf. So today's webinar is going to focus on uh, energy storage finance, and we have a, a series of just excellent uh, professional speakers here that are experts in the area of energy storage finance. So we're really excited for them to be here today. Um, we're gonna open things up with our keynote introductory speaker. Michael Ducker is the Vice President of Renewable Fuels and Western Region at Mitsubishi Hitachi Power Systems Americas as a major equipment supplier and energy solutions provider for the power industry. Michael is responsible for overseeing the development and execution of Mitsubishi Hitachi Power Systems recently launched renewable fuels business, which focuses on delivering carbon-free solutions to the power industry and other verticals. Additionally, Michael is responsible for sales and business development for new power equipment within the Western region of the United States. Prior to his current role, Michael was a founding member and, contrib and contributor to Mitsubishi Hitachi Power Systems Next Division, which develops, launches, incubates, and turns over new businesses at the company. While also at Mitsubishi Hitachi Power Systems, Michael established and led its market analysis division and originally started at the company in its applications and performance engineering team. Before joining Mitsubishi, Michael worked for the United States Department of Energy, where he developed market models to evaluate advanced energy technologies being pursued by the DOE. And with that, I will turn things over to Michael. Michael, welcome. Thanks, Kevin. Can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the great introduction there. And uh, again, for um, <clears throat> everyone involved here hosting uh, this this webinar. So you said this is really my, my first keynote where uh, I've, I've been able to do it with a uh, uh, in a polo and shorts. And I run the risk that I could have my three year old or son or five year old daughter interrupt at any moment. But this, uh, that's the you know, case in point here today. So, um, you know, really for the um, you know, opening here for this this panel session, what I wanted to walk through and set the stage on is what's enabling, what's happening in the market now It's enabling companies like Mitsubishi and, and some of our other great speakers on the panel today uh, to not only develop, but obviously finance and invest in, you know, in these great energy storage projects. Um, and so really try to set the stage with that and walk through what we're seeing here in the market. And, and again, what's, what's really uh, uh, elevating and, and enabling the, the opportunities today. So, Oftentimes, what we refer to happening in the power grid is um, uh, overall decarbonization efforts is really being done in two phases. And really what we see here is phase one uh, predominantly has been the retirement and replacement of coal-fired power plants with a combination of natural gas and renewables. And in, you know, this has been really ongoing since the early 2000s. We've actually seen since 2005 a 40% reduction in CO2 emissions in the power sector just because of this transition that's been happening really across the U.S. But we're already seeing some parts of the country, even particularly the West, 
where that phase is largely complete. I mean, you look at some states in the West, there's no coal fire generation left. Uh, all we have now is, is really a combination of gas and renewables. So to get to the deeper decarbonization, this phase two, we're starting to see that, that emerge now. And that's really trying to tackle the long-term intermittency, which you know, is currently managed by natural gas units uh, and being done so now with energy storage. And so this is really what's, what's opening the gates here for energy storage uh, across the board and, and why we're seeing uh, you know, such promise here uh, looking forward, particularly again here in the West. So, uh, you know, my role, we're focused uh, right now on, on hydrogen as a company, though. Uh, we, we offer both lithium ion energy storage and hydrogen energy storage. What I'd say in this slide is you could, you know, pretty much take off the, the green hydrogen and almost say, why now for energy storage in, in power gen? And, and, you know, first and foremost, the, the biggest signpost we're looking at uh, is regulatory. And, you know, is there regulatory and legislative environment that is promoting, uh, you know, net zero or, or zero carbon targets? Uh, that's really what's driving a lot of the decision making uh, by you know many of the states and, and a lot of our customers even uh, to to ultimately be looking to add new renewable resources to support the decarbonization efforts. Now, as we're adding more and more of those renewables, the issue we're running into is uh, as we get to certain thresholds, running into uh, greater uh, intermittency and, and really the curtailments that are becoming a factor where we actually are over generating so much renewables at times where the grid doesn't need it um, that's really creating that signal for storage and so i'm going to focus on those two items the others uh, pertain a bit more on, on the hydrogen piece and uh, again for for really this keynote i'll focus more on, on those first two drivers so first of all when we look at the western u.s um, and really the u.s as a whole but particularly the west we see very aggressive decarbonization targets and you know i think uh, for those on the call here, certainly uh, very uh, well understood what, where some of these targets are at and what's being asked. At the end of the day, we're not just seeking to decarbonize even the power grid. We're looking at efforts to decarbonize economies as a whole. And the prevailing way that's being done to support that has been installing more and more uh, renewable energy on the grid. And going forward, most of the incentives and most of the uh, uh, policy drivers continue to place the emphasis on adding more renewables to the system to support these overall directives to decarbonize, again, not just the power sector, uh, but actually economies as a whole. So in, in achieving and you know, attempting to achieve that, that mission, we're now running into the issue of um, where grids and, and, and our market is signaling that need for more storage options. And you know, everyone here, I'm sure, very familiar with California and the, the proverbial duck curve. Uh, that we see, but if we look on the left here, this is California uh, um, up through just this past June, looking at curtailments. And at just 30% renewable integration today in California, we've seen upwards of 300,000 megawatt hours of curtailment within a month. Again, when, when I say curtailment, to make sure we're on the same page, we have effectively cost-free and more importantly, carbon-free energy that's available ready to run, your know, sun's shining, the wind's blowing, but because we have so much installed of the system and it's a period of time where the load doesn't match with the, amount of, uh, with the amount of generation that's available, we actually have to shut down these carbon-free and again, arguably cost-free resources. And the problem becomes that you, you create this dynamic that the more solar and the more wind we keep adding, we actually just exacerbate this issue. We're not, we're not actually gonna continue to get lower carbon targets, we have, to, we have to start getting into the to uh, how do we mitigate and redistribute where energy is needed at times of day versus when you know, energy is being produced. And it's not always a one-to-one -one, uh, match as we're seeing here in this graph. On the right side, this shows uh, just a, a snapshot view of if California, for instance, were to achieve 100% uh, renewable energy, what would the net surplus and net deficits look like? And so now we go beyond the, you know, again, the proverbial duck curve of intradaily mismatch between supply and demand. So now we're getting into uh, mismatches across seasons between supply and demand. And so, you know, the, the challenge at hand here is not whether or not we can decarbonize with renewables. Again, that's a lot of the directive and where many states are going. It's now tackling that next challenge, that next phase two, which is how do we handle that intermittency, not just within a day, but also across seasons. And this is really where storage becomes an important point 
And when we think about, again, why Mitsubishi and why others on the panel are investing today in storage, it's these market signals that are helping driving those investment decisions in these project development. Uh, and these are the market signals, again, that all of us are, are really watching. So when we think of storage, um, you know, at least we'll, we'll throw this slide up to, to, to level set. Many people and everyone's familiar with lithium ion batteries, uh, you know, over the course of the past, you know, maybe five or so years, that's uh, received a lot of attention uh, and its support to help mitigate and, and, and really balance uh, uh, energy demand at, you know, from a couple minutes to, you know, several hours. Uh, for those, you know, paying attention to news now today too, and, and a lot of the market drivers in industry, uh, hydrogen now kind of resurfacing here. And I say resurfacing because you're know, going back to my days at DOE in the early 2000s, you know, a lot of us were talking about hydrogen economy and what was about to come. What was different back then than it is today is it goes back to those market signals of what I talked about, of what's driving energy storage and what's driving the market. Fundamentally, we're at a different point today here in 2020 than we are we than we were in 2000, 2005. So when we think about the need to uh, for energy storage, uh, you know, at least what we see here or, or what um, the, the the technologies to tackle this really get split up into two more: the short duration intradaily storage needs, which uh, predominantly be served by lithium ion batteries, and then more your long duration, uh, even seasonal needs, and that need being met by hydrogen. And the projects we're actually investing in today, uh, you know, again, I think lithium ion batteries, uh, a lot of people well versed in there. Hydrogen really kind of in its nascent stage right now, not from a technology standpoint, but just from this market application standpoint. And these are the projects we're investing in today, and, and uh, I'll talk about the end here, really combining these three aspects of having a production piece of, of taking curtailed renewables, converting it to hydrogen, storing that hydrogen in salt caverns or uh, you know, even pipeline, and then taking that hydrogen and, and converting it back to usable electricity via hydrogen gas turbine, that uh, the types that Mitsubishi sells. This ecosystem here really represents, again, from a storage standpoint, what we're seeing uh, today in the market. So we recently just released a report um, with uh, uh, E3 Consulting, um, and so encouraged to, to look at this uh, report. It was just out maybe about a, a week ago. And what we learned in that report really was two important things as we think about financing and developing energy storage projects. Um, first of all, it's, it's what I just addressed in the prior, prior slides. When we think about the economics of storage, really looking at two almost case studies here. You've got lithium ion batteries, which really are ideal for short duration intraday storage, whereas hydrogen is much more ideal for long duration intraday storage. And so, you know, we think about those technologies, they're not competing against each other. They're really working in concert with each other to address the, the slide I showed earlier, you know, where we're again looking between the, the, the duck curve and, and meeting those needs uh, versus the, uh, you know, more of the seasonal needs as we add more and more renewables. So as we see these market signals materialize and as we uh, evaluate what's the best way to cost effectively store energy, um, this was an important item we learned through this study and in, in its release here just recently of the value between lithium ion batteries uh, and hydrogen. So really just the last points we would want to draw out is, you know, from a financing standpoint, project development, what are we doing, uh, you know, Mitsubishi, uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, particularly those in the state of Utah are familiar with our project, where we partnered with Magnum Development with our Advanced Clean Energy Storage Project. And this is uh, this project itself uh, will be the world's largest energy storage system uh, where we're, we will be providing uh, upwards of one gigawatt and 150 gigawatt hours of energy storage. And we can do such large amounts of storage because of the energy density and the value of hydrogen uh, that it can bring to the table in, in being able to cost effectively uh, really scale up energy storage. And so when we look at those use cases that I talked about earlier, that's really us as a project developer. Those are the market signals we're following. And now you know, we're getting to that point where we're seeing different parts of the West uh, really need these longer duration energy storage. And that's where an entity like ourselves can get comfortable around investing and really trying to advance a project of this magnitude uh, in the regions to support uh, the overall decarbonization efforts. And so really in, in closing slide here, what, I, what I'd bring up is when we think about energy storage, um, you know, we think about lithium ion batteries. Now we're looking at hydrogen. 
uh, you know, obviously one of the other great benefits here too, particularly our project in, in Utah, is um, you know investing in these technologies, investing here today, the opportunity it brings for jobs and for new infrastructure, and really supporting again this overall evolution that's happening across the U.S. Uh, and it's really being demanded, certainly not just by uh, states and, and regulators, but all the way down to the end user. Uh, and so our project in Utah, we're extremely excited uh, about what we've been uh, able to do today and what really the, the future holds as we look to, uh, to actually create a hydrogen hub, a green hydrogen hub uh, in Delta, Utah, and really support you know, part of the West's overall efforts to decarbonize. And you know, I think that's really the, the last point I'd make is as we look at financing and, and developing these projects, how critically important it is to, to be having the foresight and the strategy to think through, uh, you know, what's not just happening within the next year, but what's happening within the next five, 10 years. And as we look at these types of investments, um, really it's, it's supporting those theses, that those theses going forward uh, to support, uh, again, overall the decarbonization efforts within the region. Um, so with that uh, opening, just uh, again, wanted to uh, relatively quickly set the stage here uh, on some of the items that we've seen really influencing and enabling uh, the types of projects that Mitsubishi and, and, and others on the panel here uh, will be discussing today. And uh, really look forward to the, uh, the, the panel dialogue here today. And certainly we'll be happy to answer any questions uh, at the end. So uh, again, thank you all for your time. And uh, Kevin, I will turn it back over to you. All right. Well, thank you, Michael, for that presentation and uh, intro to the uh, to the session today. So moving on to our next presenter, uh, we have Richard Baxter. Richard Baxter is uh, president of Mustang Prairie Energy, where he bridges the financial and technical sides of the energy storage industry for investors, lenders, developers and manufacturers uh, today. Uh, Richard will be uh, covering energy storage project development and finance. Um, so with that, uh, welcome, Richard. Great. Uh, thank you very much. So, and I'm sort of doing this on the phone, so I'll just say, uh, yeah, so on page two, um, my experience has been, uh, I've been active in the energy storage business for the last 20 years through a variety of roles. And uh, the, the last bit been, I've been working with the Department of Energy uh, through Sandia on energy storage financing and pricing of systems. Uh, page three. Um, so what we're, today's panel is sort of an outgrowth of the, this effort on um, the uh, sponsored study series on financing for energy storage and taking, you know, looking that energy storage structurally is uh, financed similarly to wind, solar, uh, and thermal, but it's more complex and the factors divide, developing the market are still evolving. And so um, one of the things we're gonna try to focus on here is, or today for you, is to have you understand that there are, you know, we, we can give you some of the metrics and, and sizes of the market and those things, but what I really want to have you understand are some of the uh, implications of how the technology and its applications affect how or whether uh, people invest in these. Uh, let's go to uh, page four. So jumping way back up, you know, investors, lenders, um, you know, they're looking for a return, but if you really, you know, you have to think about it, it it's a, the highest risk adjusted return. And there, since storage has a number of different moving parts, the, 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 the aspect of going through a due diligence program is to make sure you understand what all the risks are, what all the moving parts are, and put into place a means to address them. Um, and again, you know, this works well in finance and everything else, but you know, where people get in trouble is you come up with the answer you want and you just work backwards and you force your assumptions to be a certain way. So, you know, looking at project development, it, you know, if you don't spend a lot of time on your engineering or your legal work or your market analysis, you know, you, you're, you're 
strategy, your system design, the structure uh, will be poorly designed and, and you'll have a lot of liability exposure. Um, for the revenue, a lot of times people make very generous assumptions on the revenue. And uh, so you, you'll just have, if you're lucky, you'll have that revenue. Uh, but if you take a look at it from a, uh, a, a, a uh, sort of a analysis of what the reality of what those returns might be, you realize you're really exposed to potential downside on that. Um, again, so you look to the cost side. Okay, well, we'll buy the cheapest uh, equipment. Well, you know, qual you pay for quality and you get what you pay for. So um, a lot of times, and this is probably a very important uh, item to remember when you are considering your equipment. Yes, you know, you, pay, you get what you pay for, but a lot of times, if you pay for good quality equipment that is above what other people are due, it may be cheaper for you. So a, a, the energy storage equipment is a product, but we're not talking about products here, we're talking about a project. So what you need to do is consider all of the components that go into it, the, the, the cost of the equipment, your maintenance, your warranty, your analysis, those kind of things. And that basket of costs is what you need to be focusing on. And then again, you have the financing. Um, there's a lot of people interested in energy storage. Um, and I've known a lot of developers who have to spend a lot of time educating those people. And developers, time is basically one of their most precious items. And so a, a lot of developers tend to want to focus on working with people they trust, but also they know, understand it. Um, I, I, I think one thing to understand, you know, from a mindset point of view here is um, when you're looking at operating an energy storage project, the, you know, people usually compare it to, a lot of times compare it to wind and solar, but the energy storage project is far more dynamic, much more like a thermal plant. And so you really have to have a much more understanding of that flexibility and how to uh, identify the revenue. Uh, slide five. So looking at you know, an investor conference. So on the left here, you can see what, how so solar and storage investors viewed both solar and storage. And this was you know, from 2018 to a little while ago. Um, I, I would say, you know, and, in storage, things are moving <laughs> relatively quickly. I would say that um, these items on storage are probably a little better, but maybe you know not to the same degree as solar. The other important component here is to realize that when you are having, you're trying to get an investor comfortable, there are many aspects of that. Uh, it's it's how well the project developer can model the market, whether or not the equipment is good, you know, it's been you know, the system has been designed well. All of these components make up the total level of confidence. And you know, so here on the, the right is some work I've been trying to put together on the size of the market and how much of that is going toward debt rather than equity. Um, and you know, as a rough rule of thumb, you know, the more debt you have in a market, the greater level of confidence. So therefore, the lower the cost. And if your costs are lower, you have a better chance of being uh, having a profitable project. So again, you know, the idea is you, we want to have the investors be comfortable with the investment, but also understand all those components. And if that's the case, then you can access larger, deeper, cheaper pockets of investment capital, which make your job as a project developer easier. Uh, slide six. Um, so here's a quick, you know, just generic the project economic model. Um, I'm a, I, I used to be an economist, so I'm a recovering economist now, so I always call them project economic models. It's a financial model, a performa. But the one thing I wanna kind of show here is uh, when you're looking at energy storage and talking about energy storage, 
you know, the data, the, the metrics, those are important, but your question is really important because people say, well, is it a good return? Well, how do I know what kind of technology and an application are good? Well, it has a levelized cost. Uh, yeah, and, and a lot of times people are going after levelized costs of storage. And, and that's a good metric, but as you can see, you know, there's technical economic market inputs into how the project operates and that gives you the levelized cost of storage or net present value. From an investor's point of view, they're also interested in the financial and project development inputs, which are separate and help go into the project finance discussion. So as you are looking to support the development of an energy storage industry and deployment within energy storage, uh, oh, I mean, excuse me, within Utah, understanding you know, what questions you're trying to answer to help the industry is really important because there's a lot of very uh, highly visible metrics out there like, well, we need to figure out how to drive the LCOS down. And yeah, that, that, that would definitely make the, the system operate well, but it's not necessarily what the investors or developers are looking for uh, directly. Uh, slide seven. So energy storage technologies are a great tool. They can do many different things. Because of that, looking, trying to be very clear semantically of, of the words we use. So, you know, there are, depend, you know, there's a, many different ways you can use a battery energy storage or system or any type of energy storage. And, uh, PNNL and Sandia have developed a report called a protocols report, which has a lot of good description on, on the technical level of how the battery works, and then that gets translated into a market application. So let's just taking a step back and just say, you know, when you use a battery to provide a service, it will generate some type of value. The value is specific to that customer and, and you know how they value it. Um, you have to understand when you know a lot of the technical needs for supporting one application may interfere with another one. So as I said before, when an you know to be successfully develop an energy storage system, you have to think a little bit more like a thermal development plant. This is what I mean, that it isn't I find the most valuable application and then I figure out what the next valuable application and then I next figure out what the next valuable application. You have to realize it's a little bit more like a, a jigsaw puzzle where some of the pieces overlap, so you have to choose what basket is the most valuable one. Um, and that will create the most value. Second, you know, the next thing below is when you're looking at revenue. Revenue, uh, values are not revenue. Depending on the development of your market for the market rules for identifying how these systems technically operate and then are translated into values and then revenue for somebody so they can be recognized. Now, and, and as I show here, you know, some of these are very discreetly designed like uh, frequency regulation. There's a lot of market rules about what exactly that is and how people can clearly identify what they are um, and what the value is in, in, in terms of revenue. Another, you know, systems like Black Start, they're very valuable, um, but they're usually very specific to a location or a person or, you know, or, or system. And so it's sort of a bilateral, bilateral contract with that one group for that one application. And then there's other things that like reliability. Everybody likes having a very reliable power grid. Identifying the revenue for what reliability is is incredibly difficult as it changes by the day, the location, seasonal. And so this is where um, if you're to support more financing of projects, helping to very clearly identify technically what the applications are and how they can be translated into 
revenue streams that are understandable for developers, then the developers and the, and the investors w w will craft projects around them. But if they can't understand or clearly identify a revenue stream, then it's hard for them to put a project together. Uh, slide eight. So uh, cost system dynamics. So, so just to have a understanding that, you know, all of these battery systems, it, it's not simply just a battery, but, you know, you have multiple components within it. And this is sort of getting back to on the, the cost side, looking at the, from a sort of a due diligence point of view, you're looking at how do I make this system reliable so that the, the technology is bankable and the technology is bankable for that certain project. So a lot of times, you know, so this kind of goes toward uh, the performance of the system and whether or not the battery is capable of sustaining a certain application. And, and that's sort of the design of the battery of itself and how long of a duration you have. But other things are very important. One thing that also uh, comes up a lot is sort of the, the HVAC or the, the system cooling. You need to make sure that if you're going to operate the system a lot or you're going to operate it in a very hot environment, it has to be cooled more so that it stays within uh, the warranty oper the, the warranty range that the battery manufacturers produce also and, and because that will allow the battery to last longer. Again, thinking of it more of a project cost than a simple one-time purchase. Um, and then really quickly, uh, slide nine. Uh, again, now, you know, thinking not just the different components, but sort of how they interact. Um, there, you know, there's a, a lot of different buckets of costs that go into this. And, you know, just from the initial cost of the equipment and the, you know, the EPC and designing it, um, I have here augmentation, you know, depending on whether or not you need to maintain the capability of the battery uh, at a certain level, you have to add batteries uh, longer uh, down the road. So taking, sorry, let me explain something here. Uh, the ba a battery generally has a certain amount of throughput energy that you can cycle through it over its lifespan. The more you use it uh, and under worse conditions, the quicker it will it will die. Or, you know, the, it will use up its lifespan. So this is how, and depending on the contract you're going to sign as a project developer, you may need to add more batteries to maintain the capability of that system. This comes in, you know, comes into, you know, additional costs. Uh, you also see, you know, so you have physical, or excuse me, you have capital costs. You also have operating costs, like the, the cost of the round trip efficiency losses, um, the operating expenses, the warranty. Now this will, you know, so the, the, there's two components. From a financing point of view, this is also important because as you think about it, you know, there's a certain amount of money that you need to put into the project to build it and operate it. From a financial engineering point of view, you can capitalize a lot of these operating expenses to a one-time fee up front. So for a large, for example, for larger projects, a lot of times you, end, you pay for a extended warranty for the battery over its lifespan. But back down in the residential or maybe small commercial, a lot of times the OEMs have already capitalized that warranty into the purchase price. So you know they brought all those operating costs to the one time, you know, to the one time fee. You know you can also do it a different way and, and convert a capital cost over to operating expenses, so that people who want you know such as a lease, so that if you don't want to pay capital costs, but you want to pay operating costs. So again, it's sort of, there's a bucket of money that's required to build and operate the system, but through the design of the financing, you can change how that is perceived 
from an accounting point of view. And then the last time, uh, project returns, page 10. Um, here's a, uh, McKinsey did a really good analysis. Um, um, NREL over in, in Boulder, uh, the, the Department of Energy's EERE supports a, uh, build, a commercial building uh, database. And they design, you know, as you can see, all these different types of buildings and in a bunch of different cities. And so what these guys, you know, McKinsey did is go through and design a lot of projects and ran them through this and, and see how how profitable it would be. And so far it looks pretty good. A few things you can quickly understand here, or quickly view is, you know, regional specific, some colors are a little bit more off to the right than the left. Use case, um, you know, certain schools seem to be, uh, you know, certain, uh, certain uh, office, type buildings are, are more prevalent on one side than the other. Uh, scale, you know, the, the, the vertical lines are a little more together on the left than on the right. So a lot of time, you know, signifying that a lot of times you need a certain amount of scale to be able to be cost effective. Uh, the second, and then, you know, the last here, you know, the second thing is the assumptions and the reliance. Well, Depending on what numbers you that go into an assumption will can directly affect how it goes out. You know, as you can see, this was 2015. Um, they have a four percent weighted average cost of capital. I would consider that incredibly low uh, and would be great um, if you were to use something that was a little higher and a little more realistic. Uh, that you would probably be paying more, and so therefore that would kind of shift that break-even point over to the right a little bit. Um, I can't remember the, the price they had on the batteries, uh, but if they were lower, you know, than what other people were assuming at the time, you know, that also helps, you know, uh, provide more of those spaces, you know, more projects that would be profitable. So I think that that's where, you know, as a develop, you know, developers and, and lenders and capital providers have to review those models to make sure that they actually are kind of realistic. And then finally, you know, the, for the profitability forecast, you know, there, we are looking at these revenue, or we're looking at these applications and we're trying to figure out if they will support a project. And there's a couple of things that as we're still evolving, you know, trying to say that, you know, the, the, trying to understand and have a value. And, and, the, and maybe one of the core things is the value of flexibility. Energy storage systems are incredibly flexible and can provide a significant amount of technical and economic support for the power grid and customers. And if you want private developers to develop them and investors to invest in them, the you know, helping them helping to clearly identify what those values are and giving a certainty into those revenue streams will allow them to develop projects and lower their cost of capital, um, and so that, and so they can build them. Um, so slide eleven. Um, now we'll get into the smart people. Uh, so. We have four really great speakers today. Um, and I'm just gonna say like, so Troy Miller at GE Power, um, he is the p recent past president of, or recent past chairman, I'm sorry, of the Energy Storage Association Board of Directors and can give you a little out, uh, overview of how um, the, the other lessons learned from other states. Uh, Jeff Bishop of Key Capture Energy is uh, a very successful and, and growing development firm and lives in Utah, so has a little more experience there. Uh, Scott Daniels of Schneider Electric is a well-known expert in understanding how the performance of these systems can impact their operation and bankability. And then Alan Dash, uh, Perfect Power, is an investor funding the development of these projects and can provide that perspective. So again, you know, we, we brought these guys together to give you a, a clear understanding from all the different directions of how these things are put together so that investors have confidence. And so I will, um, you know, I'll, I'll move off and, and I guess maybe Troy, if you could go ahead and start up. 
Sure. Again, this is uh, Troy Miller, uh, Lead North American Sales for GE uh, Renewable Hybrids. I've got a few slides that I'm going to walk through here. Um, essentially, in, how do we enable the clean transition of energy through hybrid systems? So storage solutions can enable multiple business cases uh, from standalone storage delivering grid reliability to co-location with thermal and renewable assets in front of the meter or behind the meter for distributed or microgrid applications. They span uh, short duration power like we heard about before to deliver grid services or long duration applications that enable energy shifting and the dispatchability of variable renewable assets. One of the interesting cases that you can see here is that of the hybrid enhanced gas turbine, which uh, we co-locate energy storage underneath uh, a single interconnect with a 50 megawatt uh, peaking power plant from our air derivatives. Uh, for In this case, uh, the picture that you're seeing here is um, in Southern California for Southern California Edison. And they said um, about a year ago for the California um, ISO when they were reporting back on this particular project that it was one of the most valuable projects that they had. And essentially, um, it was allowing them to extend the life of an asset that was in the ground and cut the greenhouse gases in half and uh, cut the fuel usage in half as well. The systems that we're deploying are fully modular and we're calling uh, their GE Reservoir and it's based on an 8 by 20 foot footprint that can be deployed in all these use cases. Um, many of them, either AC or DC coupled, DC coupled for solar uh, primarily, we're offering it an, an NMC and LFP, so both um, uh, nickel manganese cobalt and uh, iron phosphate, and we're providing one to four hour systems that can be added to as the, or the, the market needs grow. So we have a particular architecture that allows for uh, you to start with a one hour system and then as the needs grow for that particular market, you can expand out into, um, into a two and a three and a four hour systems as well. And because of that particular architecture, you're able to put dissimilar batteries from, uh, for instance, an LFP and an uh, NMC battery on the same bus from different manufacturers as well. One of the things that Richard talked about was the flexibility of energy storage systems. And we have a project that we commissioned a number of years back that started as a ramping flexibility um, project with IID. It started as a 30 megawatt uh, ramping. And in, after about a year, we recommissioned the system to, to allow for it to do black start of a 44 megawatt, uh, 44 megawatt uh, com uh, combustion turbine that was there as well. So it started out as ramping only and can very quickly move into, uh, into um, other use cases. One of the things about hybrids is that it really makes the, when you add storage to traditional forms of generation, it makes the system more dispatchable, which allows the developer to shape the output needs um, really to the interconnecting node, making the resource more valuable and most likely allowing the contracted revenue in terms of either a multi-year PPA when you think of this, you can think of um, like the heat map that was created by APS down in Arizona, and some of the developers were responding to that using solar plus storage by creating uh, gen or guaranteeing generation when it was needed in the uh, hours uh, in the later part of the day. So there, are, what ways can you finance energy storage? Generally speaking, uh, storage to distribution utilities is done through most most often T and D T and D deferral or cost avoidance. Oftentimes financed through a guaranteed rate of return. And what we're seeing from our developer partners is um, a lot of the contracted revenue being financed through debt. So in California, resource adequacy capacity or the PPA can be financed through debt. And the market applications, ancillary services, energy arbitrage, trading is often financed through equity. The real value of storage is, is, is now and in the future in localized capacity. Um, 
recently in the journal Applied Energy, there was a report that came out that said it uh, makes the overall system much more efficient by reducing the need for renewable investments by making that renewable dispatchable, uh, reducing the need for peaking power plants and deferring transmission upgrades. Oh, here is a particular project that, uh, that we did in upstate New York. It's a DC coupled system that was financed using debt and equity. And there was some NYSERDA funding that was provided as well for this particular project. It's DC coupled. Uh, there are two solar arrays. It's a one-to-one -one output. So it was a five megawatt solar coupled with five megawatts, 20 megawatt hours of storage underneath the, um, underneath a single inverter. Less CapEx associated with that, and they were able to take the entire ITC credit because of this. It's, it's allowing the developer and in, in the interconnect at this particular node to shape the output. And um, when we were doing the due diligence, the insurance was they, they were at, <clears throat> they were needed to go through some of the insurance products to be able to access that debt for this particular project. Here's a thermal hybrid that we commissioned at the end of last year. It is a seven and a half megawatt, seven and a half megawatt hour energy storage system that provides black start for a 150 megawatt uh, power station, uh, 7F03 gas turbine and for Entergy in their Perryville power station. In this particular uh, project, they were doing it primarily for cost avoidance. They were keeping a number of very old diesel generators alive, utilized only for uh, the black starting of this asset. And so they were able to get a rate of return on this particular um, job. And when it's not being used for black start, it's going to be used uh, for ancillary services in that, in that market. This is a system that we uh, installed full EPC in an existing building, uh, 41 megawatt, 41 megawatt hour, that is, uh, has the ability to trade on-demand power for approximately 100,000 UK homes. It relieves pressure on the electrical grid and provides flexibility. It was actually the very first merchant-only system in the UK. Uh, we provided the full turnkey, including the racks, balance of plant, fire suppression, and this was 100% financed through equity. Since I am, as Richard said, a board member of the ESA, I wanted to give some food for thought given the audience that, uh, that I think that we have here. And so what are the barriers to entry for energy storage in that public policy needs to address? The first is you, you know, cannot value or compensate for that storage flexibility. Um, and so how do we get the values that it can bring the flexibility to flow to the right parties? It's designing the markets that, uh, that can have that so the developers can understand the rules so that it can get deployed. And so tariff and rate design, wholesale market products, and cost benefit studies. Now, the second thing is it's really unable to compete in all of the grid planning and procurements. Um, the IRPs, you can see the wholesale market rules, uh, greenhouse gas reduction and renewable standards. One of the things that in this particular area, there are, uh, for instance, PJM has got a um, eight hour capacity requirement, probably only needed because of leftover from the reggae guys that are trying to make sure that they can, that their uh, thermal assets can participate in this marketplace, but not really necessary. And so trying to understand making storage able to compete in all these grid planning things in the, the recent win with uh, FERC Order 841 that I, I think Jeff is going to talk a little bit more about really does uh, level that playing field. And then, you know, not being able to access all the grid or constrained for narrow use, um, lengthy interconnect processes, not understanding the, the need for hybrids under a single interconnect, making, you know, in, in Texas currently there's a kind of a forced um, requirement for co-location of energy storage as opposed to allowing the interconnective storage under an existing an existing interconnect. 
And ownership rules, also Texas, or, um, it is a state law that forbids any distribution utility from being able to trade in, in any ancillary services markets to allow for um, to allow for offsetting of those revenue costs. And you know, the last slide: what what can Utah policymakers do to promote storage? Up, updating regulations. Um, requiring IRPs to examine storage and system flexibility needs to take that into account, um, including storage specific considerations and interconnect rules and allowing models um, to be for, for localities to adopt. Um, here, big one, pilot storage deployment. I think that's happening in Utah, like we're talking about for wires infrastructure and allow um, non-wires alternatives, which could include storage. And then, you know, the, the, some of the things that other states have done is developing energy storage deployment targets and reducing those soft costs by rebates for early adopters, like we've seen with uh, the NYSERDA funding for solar plus storage and some of the, pro some of the programs, the SDRIP programs in California. So I think that's, that's my last slide. I'm going to be turning it over to Mr. Bishop, CEO of Key Capture Energy. So. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Troy. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jeff Bishop, and uh, yeah, as Troy said, I'm a founder and a CEO of uh, Key Capture Energy. Uh, next slide, please, Kevin. So uh, Kevin and Richard have put together a panel that um, is going to be approaching the financing world from multiple different angles. Uh, so I, I represent the project developers. And so we as a company, we develop, construct, own, and operate battery storage projects, uh, primarily in uh, New York and Texas, although uh, we uh, are hoping that the New England market will, will hit at some point. So uh, we're the largest owner of battery storage in New York at this point. We are the second largest owner uh, down in Texas and uh, soon to be number one as we start construction next month on uh, 200 megawatts of, of our, our next battery storage projects. And then uh, overall, uh, you know, we, we have a bunch of projects with a bunch of different revenue streams that uh, we are moving through the development process uh, into operations. Um, one point, uh, so although we are headquartered in New York with an office down in Houston, uh, my partner took a job at, uh, the, at Huntsman as an oncologist up there. And so uh, the two of us moved to Salt Lake City two years ago, and uh, hence uh, why we have a Salt Lake City office as well. Uh, next slide, please. So energy storage in Utah, it's, it's really not a question of if it will happen, but just a question of when. And so uh, as you all have heard from uh, the previous uh, energy storage panels uh, through the series, uh, there, there's a lot of movement going on both in Utah and, and in the broader region. And so in uh, the broader region uh, specifically, uh, so you have Pacific Ore, which is the uh, incumbent utility who, you know, had purchased Rocky Mountain Power uh, a number of years ago. And uh, their latest integrated resource plan uh, basically is, is calling for a, a really rather quick transition uh, whenever we look at it on, on the power side. And so 20 out of the 24 coal-fired units from Washington to Idaho to Wyoming, uh, down to Utah, some Northern California, uh, will be offline in the next 18 years. Um, this will be happening simultaneously while there will be a tremendous amount of new renewables, uh, some of it backed by energy storage, some energy storage by itself. And to facilitate that, it's, uh, you know, construction of a very long transmission line from the windy part of Wyoming to uh, northern Utah. And, and there are plans both for, uh, you know, renewables in Utah and in the broader region and uh, transmission to facilitate that. And so, um, Always, it's, it's, it's a little awkward when uh, I have a conversation in, in Utah, uh, up at the Capitol or at any Utah function, and, and people bring up coal. Uh, fundamentally, coal has its purpose. All forms of energy has its purpose. But uh, it's a fundamental question that, that I ask folks of, would you encourage your kids to get into coal generation at this point? And, uh, you know, the answer is inevitably no. And so uh, we do know in Utah, 70% uh, of our generation comes from coal. Um, it's crucial from a, you know, job uh, perspective, from uh, property tax, from uh, local knowledge. 
But really, it's now the question of what can we be doing here in the state in order to, uh, you know, make sure that uh, our workforce, our folks, our, our approach is relevant for uh, 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. Uh, luckily, you, you do have a, uh, you know, Utah Energy Office that is uh, thinking about this a, a lot. Uh, up at the University of Utah, uh, Dr. Pravarnia and uh, his colleagues uh, are <laughs> wicked smart and, uh, you know, are thinking about energy storage in, in ways that other states definitely aren't. And uh, there's definitely a local educated population that, uh, you know, has the ability for that transition. And so, uh, overall, uh, it, it's really not a question of, of you know, if it's going to hit, but it's just a question of when and, and what the baby steps are along the way. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we'll just skip right on over this. You all have heard this from uh, Dr. Laura Nelson and others. So uh, if you can go on to the next slide as well. So really, uh, it, it comes from a developer perspective, uh, you know, as we look at the financing options, um, energy storage has, has really already gone mainstream. And so uh, when I was founding the company uh, three, four years ago, uh, basically at that point, all the equity providers, they were looking for, you know, 20 year lock in revenues, 15% on levered returns. And uh, those, those don't exist because those exist in a uh, solar and wind world. But as Richard discussed earlier, uh, these projects look a lot more like merchant natural gas than they look like, uh, you know, a traditional wind or solar asset. And so the real owners of these projects and, you know, the real thinking behind them should actually be the thermal IPPs. It, it should be the coal and natural gas companies because they're the ones that, uh, you know, are really able to do all the market operations, uh, you know, the ongoing uh, maintenance, uh, you know, and, and keeping the project working at 100%, uh, rather than, you know, a wind or solar company that historically has just put intermittent electrons onto the grid and, and you take the power price uh, as it is. And so instead, when we set the company up, uh, you know, as a developer, uh, we, we were looking at our options of do you go to California and, you know, compete for uh, very limited resource adequacy contracts out there? Uh, or do you go after uh, niches that other folks aren't necessarily in? And so we chose New York and Texas and New England, uh, mainly because they're, uh, you know, very liquid markets. Uh, there's a lot of entrance uh, coming and, and exits as far as companies go. And uh, it, it does allow for a lot of bilateral contracts and other ways in order to um, lock in your revenue source over a period of time. Uh, one fascinating part about the equity is that uh, uh, energy storage folks want to talk about it and learn about it at this point. But um, you, you do know that not all equity is, is correct for this space. And uh, what I mean by that is, you know, for the folks that historically have had, you know, really predictable uh, revenue streams such as wind or solar or, uh, you know, even, you know, rate-based utility, uh, the types of contracts and the types of structure that uh, battery storage get and the amount of market operations that need to occur to uh, really increase your returns both on the day ahead and real-time basis. Uh, does require a different source of capital than, uh, you know, what some of the folks wanting to come into the space are like. And so on the equity side, um, with us as a developer, for our first 50 megawatts of projects, we, we, we didn't even go beyond equity. Uh, we knew that getting into debt, um, you know, as, as Richard talked about uh, earlier, um, it does require a ton of scrutiny and a ton of educating, uh, both, you know, the debt side, uh, the uh, independent engineers, the insurance council, the borrower council, the local council, the lender council, and uh, where we were as a company, we, we just weren't in that space. And so with us now, uh, you know, we are uh, about to construct 200 megawatts down in Texas. We add that to our 30 megawatts currently in operations down there. And uh, suddenly we, we have a, you know, portfolio of projects to put debt on that, um, you know, look very attractive to, to lenders. And so on the equity side, you know, anywhere, uh, you know, you, you might put in 20% at the low end to 100% at the high end. And then mezzanine financing, debt financing is, you know, still relatively up in the air. Uh, the public debt financings at this point um, have been around uh, LIBOR plus, you know, three to 400 and uh, loan to value ratios of about 60%. 
And so whenever you combine, you know, equity with, let's call it a 10% cost of capital with uh, project debt, which is, you know, around a 5% cost of capital, uh, 60, 70% loan to value, uh, suddenly you're getting a baked in weighted average cost of capital around seven and a half to 8%, which uh, does make these projects, uh, you know, look a lot more attractive. Uh, where the industry is, uh, just as far as, you know, which bucket of capital is, is doing what, uh, there is a lot of MES financing out there, and so, you know, that will be more expensive than your term debt, and so as much as possible, you want to be able to get on that term debt, but uh, it is a way to, you know, really lever up your project if, if that's what you so desire. Uh, one really interesting thing for me as a project developer is uh, just the amount of uh, capital that folks are willing to put on fully merchant projects. And so with us, um, we, we like treating these like merchant natural gas plants where uh, as long as you cover 60% of your uh, annual revenue in uh, some sort of you know, financial instrument um, to always have a floor, uh, you can always cover your debt service and as such, uh, you know, you, you can get really good leverage on it. But uh, we are seeing that there are debt providers out there, credible ones, um, that are willing to put money down uh, on projects that are fully merchant. And uh, a lot of that is just coming down to the versatility of batteries um, that uh, both Troy and Richard, you know, discussed, um, in that they can do a multitude of things. And so, for instance, um, our West Texas projects, they're right in the middle of the Permian Basin. And uh, over there, uh, you know, before the COVID-related oil destruction demand, uh, they were making a lot of money. Uh, there was a lot of electricity congestion, and as such, any time we dispatched, you know, prices were very high. And now that uh, the prices are not as high as, uh, you know, the number of rigs out there are down 70% compared to three months ago, uh, then you shift your battery and have it do other use cases that, that batteries can do. And so the versatility of batteries really are helping uh, at this point, just as far as the long-term value. And uh, for the lenders who really have been through this process, understand it, have done the due diligence, uh, they're getting comfortable uh, with, you know, the long-term revenue projections and uh, are, are putting covenants around that. Uh, in the Q&A, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this, uh, you know, a lot more, I'm sure, and uh, definitely want to uh, keep it open for, for the other folks. But um, the entire energy storage industry is in a transition where a lot of people talk about it, but not many people actually do it. And so there's a lot of big plans, a lot of press releases out there uh, as far as you know, what's, what's going to hit. And uh, some of that is, is going to be real, and some of that, you know, won't. But, um, you know, we as an independent company, we're going to be having 250 megawatts in the ground by, you know, summer of 21. And so as such, um, you know, really the sector has already gone beyond the pilot projects and, you know, really has gone into the point of uh, getting up to scale. And so uh, as we look at um, what can be done in Utah, uh, you know, I, I Look forward to, uh, you know, potential non-wires alternatives that we could compete on uh, for distribution deferral. We're doing one in New York where we're doing a build transfer with the local utility up there um, and any other ways for, you know, us to compete in order to, uh, you know, be able to build a project here and uh, keep me at home uh, more often <laughs> and uh, go down to Texas and uh, up to New York. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Jeff. So uh, I, I believe next we'll uh, we'll move on to uh, Scott Daniels, uh, Director of Technology and Business Strategy at APC Snyder Electric. Thank you, Kevin. So. Today, I'm just going to introduce a little bit more of a flavor of bridging uh, technology and system performance and give a little introduction on um, the differences between batteries and how you assess them and match them to an application and how those choices can impact the life of the batteries and also impact uh, the life of the system and the bottom line performance. Just a quick introduction on Schneider Electric. Uh, in 2019, we had over 27 billion um, in euros 
and revenue, and 41% uh, of our revenues come from new economies. We have 135,000 employees, and in the ener energy management sector, uh, we have 21 billion um, euro in revenue. I'm just going to give an introduction to energy and power battery systems. And one of the key things, uh, when you select a battery energy storage system, no matter the technology, it's very similar to buying a car. Um, a lot of folks uh, don't have the technical background. If somebody like me and other folks have uh, discussed batteries and projects on this in this webinar. Uh, but when you buy a car, you just don't ask one question. Uh, you look at a lot of things such as how big is your family? Are you gonna to tow? Do you need a good fuel economy or range for battery EV? So these types of uh, metrics also apply uh, when you look at um, energy storage systems. And I have a little, uh, it looks overwhelming, but generally it's, it's very uh, simple when you look at this uh, slide. At uh, the bottom is higher power uh, battery systems and the top is uh, pure energy systems. And there's a lot of differences in between. And I just wanted to show some relationships uh, between a pure EV car at the very top, uh, going down to um, a plug-in hybrid, to a hybrid, to a micro hybrid. As you're moving down that EV range, you're also moving up into power capabilities. And there's trade-offs between these systems. In this slide, um, I talk about uh, run times. And uh, in these run times, if pure EV, it could be beyond four hours. I just tried to simplify it. Um, and like a, a plug-in hybrid could be a mid-rate, 30 minutes to an hour. But things that you have to realize is that the components that make up these battery systems, uh, let's just look at lithium ion for now, because flow batteries and other technologies don't have these root building blocks. Uh, but the cell might be a high power cell, but when it's put into a system, because of cooling uh, constraints, because of other things, it actually, the system itself is now a one hour system instead of the cell alone could be a 10 minute cell. And I don't wanna get too deep into the woods here, but to uh, on the right, this is a, a Schneider Electric APC portfolio uh, where I, a lot of people are familiar with UPSs and typical UPSs are designed to run on batteries for 10 minutes, just to kind of like a safe shutdown. Uh, you even have bridge the gen sets, which are two minute, three minute, five minute systems. But then you have long duration energy storage, which in our three phase and single phase business, uh, we look at taking advantage of large format batteries. And one of those reasons for um, doing that is that in energy storage systems, the value is driven by how much active material you have in a given space. And a key component of that is you have to start off with a good root building block. Otherwise, that inefficiency translates throughout the whole system design. I'm going to go to the next slide. If anybody has questions, we can answer. I can touch base with these um, during Q&A. Now, here's an introduction to application metrics. And these application metrics are something that you have to look at before you select a battery. You have to know what you're looking for. And here on the very top, it's focused on energy applications and power applications. Uh, energy density and power density are generally the most important things in our world. But if you're building a battery and you're gonna have it in an unstable ground, then weight might be a critical uh, consideration. Another thing to note is that uh, energy density is typically based off of a unit volume, but some manufacturers confuse energy density with specific energy, which is based off of a unit mass. Um, so for energy storage for long duration projects, obviously energy density would be the important metric. And as we, um, move down this list, it's the cost of that energy is an important metric. But if you're going to do an, a quick injection or frequency regulation and you don't have a multi-use energy storage system, then the power becomes more important. So these are things that you have to kind of look at and understand. Um, I have a link down here uh, to a white paper I authored that describes this in more detail of the trade-offs when selecting a battery system. So please refer to that for more information. But these middle range of application metrics are very important, especially the round trip efficiency. If we're doing renewables integration, if we're doing peak load shifting, energy arbitrage, round trip efficiency is very, very important. But round trip efficiency is usually uh, demonstrated through power cells and power batteries that are then used uh, in a lower rate or slower uh, rate of charge and discharge where the efficiencies skyrocket. And you see that in the EV industry a lot, but you're also seeing that in the stationary industry. Okay. 
And we also have to be considerate about temperature operation. Uh, if these containers are gonna be stored and they're not gonna be conditioned, or if they're gonna be conditioned, but you don't wanna spend a lot of money and have parasitic losses, these systems have to function at elevated temperature, cold temperatures, or both. And cycle life, uh, for our line of energy storage, if we're not just doing basic generator substitution or black star, cycle life is very, very important, as well as calendar life. And both of these cycle life and calendar life uh, are cumulative. You, a lot of folks will look at a battery and they'll have some wonderful technology and someone will say, I can get 20,000 cycles and this is a 25 year battery, but then the calendar life is only 10 years. Well, you're not gonna get more than 10 years of life out of that battery. Uh, you're only going to be able to cycle it and add it. It's an additive approach, a cumulative approach, and then realize that that battery under a weekly usage or a weekday usage might only last you six or seven years. So just please remember to take these into consideration. And one of the other things is to ask the vendor if the system is actually designed for end of life. And that's a critical, critical uh, question. Uh, it's beside um, augmentation and replacing modules to keep that performance guarantee. It's also as Richard discussed, it's the cooling load on the system. The cooling load will actually increase over time because as batteries age, the majority of batteries have an increase in internal resistance. And that increase lowers round trip efficiency, generates more heat, and puts more load on the HVAC system. So these are things that need to be considered, not as a customer to design in, but a customer to ask and say, is this covered under warranty? Have you, because one of the things about a warranty with tier one manufacturers, that's easy to deal with. But with tier two manufacturers, is that manufacturer gonna be around seven years or 10 years from now if that battery were to fail? So these are the reasons why you wanna ask these questions just to get it validated. Even if it's a third party, even if it's modeled, it's very difficult to validate a 20 year calendar life when battery systems have only been around for one or two years, but still investigate and see how it's aging. It can be projected. Um, I don't want to keep on going there, but you can also uh, reach out to me after the webinar and I could explain further, but the white paper does explain a lot of detail. And then obviously in a non-application area, um, we have shelf life. This is inventory management disposal. Who's going to be responsible for end of life of these batteries? It's not a simple process to decommission. And these other ones of manufacturing and supply robustness, that's for people like me that are working with partners to make sure that uh, the supply chain isn't going to be interrupted. And you may ask uh, why safety. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, approaches to safety, uh, but no reputable energy storage company is going to use something that's deemed unsafe. There have been some instances, uh, but we all tend to use uh, safe systems no matter the chemistry. This is an example of rating application metrics because what I just reviewed can be overwhelming. But if we look at a um, peak load shift demand response type battery, we're just gonna approach as a saying, this is a peak load shift, it's gonna be used every weekday. We have a little bit of a voice of application that we could use. I just threw this together. Generally, you'd wanna work with your team, work with the, the locale where the battery is gonna be installed and how it's gonna be used. And then just quickly go through these metrics and rank them high, medium, and low. Even though people like myself know this by heart, it's a great way to communicate what are important metrics in selecting this battery? And here, the important metrics are energy density, the cost of energy, the cycle life. Counter life might not be rated as high as cycle life, even though it's nearly as important um, because you're cycling this every weekday. But because it's medium does not mean it's not important. It means that you have to satisfy the important metrics first. Uh, safety, why would it be there? You would only use something that's safe. Well, if you didn't have it there, somebody's gonna ask, why is safety a consideration? And then round trip efficiency. So these types of approaches are important, especially if you're using a whole bunch of uh, different types of batteries for different applications. You may be able to build up scale and purchasing if you can use batteries for multiple purposes, and this will help you make that decision. Let's move on to the next slide. So I have a little bit of an energy module comparison example where um, I look at uh, modules with data um, that is provided by either internal programs or external partners and suppliers. I normalize the data and I put it in radar and column charts. And the summarized data reflect metrics that are common, the ones that we just reviewed, and for the purpose of evaluating the performance of these battery modules for various applications. And this can become very big, but actually, I simplified this just for that application that I rated those metrics. 
And here uh, we see that on the right, we'll just pay attention to these columns. The higher the column is actually the, the better, even when we talk about dollars per watt, because it's normalized. I want to, with a radar chart, the further away you get from the center, the better the performance. So just please note that. But here, it's not a blanket statement. When I, when I look at these top uh, legends, we have an energy NMC. We have um, from a stationary company, tier one. We have an energy NMC from an EV company. We also have an energy LFP from another tier one company. And then we um, benchmark it against lead acid because it's just a mainstay from the past. Um, as we look through this, we can see that uh, for energy density, um, the takeaway is NMC is much more energy dense uh, as that's runtime than LFP. It does not mean that LFP is not the right choice. It's just to note that. Um, so if space is a concern, uh, especially if you're in a container, you only have so much room in a container. And if you have to get so much capacity in that container, space is a concern. Even if you're in a front of the meter um, environment where you can put a lot of containers down, you're just building up that overhead. And remember the rule of thumb is the more active material in a given space, the more value you have. So if you have all this extra overhead, your value is decreasing. Also for this particular example, NMC is much better calendar like than LFP. Um, now a small format LFP could have tremendous um, calendar life and tremendous cycle life. But for these particular vendors in large format cells, uh, they, um, LFP ironically has lower calendar life and, uh, and, and, and lower cycle life. That's not always the case. So as you're evaluating battery suppliers, you don't wanna generalize. You wanna take the offers that people are willing to sell to you and then benchmark them against each other and see which ones satisfy those application metrics the best. Because if you don't have the life, then you're gonna to have to replace the batteries and then your total cost of ownership is gonna go down and then your performance will also go down. So these are the cells that go into those modules. And uh, for some reason, I think I accidentally hit the zoom in button. Um, so I did it reverse, but these are the root building blocks. And here um, you can see that generally telling you the same thing, but in some cases you might have a cell that outperforms another chemistry or another provider. Uh, but then when you move into the module, then the module shifts. And the reason for that is, again, that active material for a given volume. Sometimes you have cooling constraints where you need to have more airflow around the individual cells. You might have a safety, a regulatory constraint where you have to uh, be sure that there's no fire uh, that could propagate from one module to another. So all of these are trade-offs. You don't have to focus on the cells as a customer, uh, but as somebody like me, as an integrator, I wanna know how that cell is being utilized, and I wanna know how that module is being utilized in a system. So every time you step up from cell, maybe sub-module to module, and then from module to rack, and then from rack to container, these are all things that lower the effectiveness of how much active material you have in a given space, and it could impact based off of cooling um, and use of the light. So I just have a couple of, if I have time, I think I have a supporting slide in this where I go a little bit more into details of the abbreviations that could be used. Um, and uh, I, think, I think that's it. So that concludes my uh, presentation. I hope this has been informative. Thank you. Kevin, I'll hand it off to you. Yes, yeah. thank you, Scott. Um, all right, well, we will move on to our last expert today. Uh, we have Alan Dash, uh, CEO, President of Perfect Power LLC. Uh, welcome, Alan. Thank you so much. Um, first slide, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, one more. That's just a cover slide. Um, Perfect Power uh, was formed in, uh, in January of this year, so we're a new fund. Um, we are oh my God, controlling these. Yeah, uh, yes, uh, handing it over to you. Let's see. I'm sorry. All right. There we go. Thank you. Um, Perfect Power was formed uh, in, in January. This is a, a, a group, six person team that came out of SER Capital Partners, Sustainable Environmental Renewable. Uh, uh, is that what that's short for? Uh, everyone came out of Equity Capital Partners, except for me. I came from uh, Starwood Energy Group. 
and uh, we're all very highly experienced in the sector. Uh, Sarah Graziano, who you can see at the top, was a uh, former VP of Corporate Development at Vistra, and she led the development of the 300 megawatt mining project, which I believe is the largest battery project in the country, if not the world. It's 1,200 megawatt hours. And uh, our, our view uh, as equity investors is um, that uh, we want to focus on control investments in the middle market. And why do we want to do that? Uh, well, the reason why is that, um, as some of the earlier speakers said, the market is developing uh, fairly well. And, uh, and places like California have, you know, big RFPs. Uh, and those are oriented towards big companies, IPPs. Uh, and uh, uh, and um, utility subs, and those companies have lower cost of capital. Um, and the middle market uh, is uh, fragmented, very highly fragmented. Not every developer is as uh, sophisticated and well capitalized as uh, Jeff's group and Key Capture. Um, and our view of the market is that um, it's still highly fragmented. Uh, it requires uh, a high level of expertise, high level of diligence. I think uh, Richard uh, aptly pointed out how complicated this is. In my view, having been an equity investor uh, for about the last uh, 15 years or so, is that this is very reminiscent of uh, solar development around the 2010-2012 period, except with a higher level of sophistication, um, which is, since these are not passive devices, these are more like little gas plants, as a few of the speakers noted. You have to know an awful lot about how markets function uh, in order to uh, be comfortable uh, underwriting uh, the risk. And so, and so, we have focused. Uh, we, we have focused on this area specifically. I want to go to the next slide. Let's see if I can get it. There we go, and give you a sense of the markets, the way we look at them. Um, we think there are sort of four markets that are starting to segment the bulk storage market, and that's, like I said, the Edison, SoCal Ed, PG&E, APS, all have these very large procurements typically every six months. That's great for lower cost of capital. That's great for your infrastructure uh, investment types. Um, at the Distribution level, this is what we like. Distribution level, commercial level, wholesale. Typically, distribution levels in front of the meter, low voltage interconnect, and 5 to 20 megawatts. So those investments look more like 10, 20, 30 million each, which is harder for the really big funds uh, to make because you have to pay a lot of attention. You need a lot of expertise in these markets. And the same thing with the commercial industrial markets. We're seeing a lot of behind the meter projects that serve a retail load. Uh, we're especially seeing these with regard to industrials in California. The fourth segment is that residential segment. You hear a lot about that. That's not a place where our equity could participate. We see states and cities and, and uh, auto companies being the prime, primary drivers of uh, capitalizing that uh, the residential sector. Um, what's our business model? We uh, co-develop. So all the developers that we've looked at and uh, the ones that we are now investing in, we provide some level of expertise to help them. And then we are owners. We're not flippers. You know, uh, it's a 10-year fund. Our intention probably is, you know, typical ownership in private equity, classical private equities years. Uh, and uh, all grid connected, like I said, not residential. As I said in the last slide, wholesale distribution, commercial industrial, microgrids. I've probably seen 30, 40, 50, you know, presentations from small regional developers, um, of which, you know, we winnow those down to a couple that we want to make uh, equity investments in. In my first year, perfect example, first year in Starwood, we have a whole year here. I think our investment rate was about 1% to 2%. So we probably saw a couple hundred proposals to invest, and we met a couple of investments is the way, is the way it works out. And that will be about the same here. 
is we started about the same there, which was middle market focus. So with regard to the locations, very similar analysis to what Jeff provided before. We have target markets. We want to have a supportive regulatory environment, passage efficiency, I'll explain what this means, incentive-based regulations. You know, the markets that we're really focused on are uh, California, Texas, New York, and Ontario, with uh, New England being a secondary market. A lot of reasons to do the, those markets are our focus, which I'll describe in a second. And we're kind of in, in the middle of all of the equity providers in that we want some contracted or hedged revenue, and then the rest is merchant market. So in Texas, for example, highly liquid market, have to take uh, uh, hedges. Uh, probably in New York, we have contracts. In California, we'll have some contracts. And all of these markets, though, are liquid markets and markets that we participate in through our trade through trading for us. Market market provides us with our upsides. So in that regard, very similar to what others have tried, we're treating these like little gas plants in the load pocket. I give California as an example, but I, I will take you quickly through all those four markets and why they're interesting. Uh, California, as we know, all these markets are more in transition, and uh, uh, there's really still quite a bit of need for local system capacity, not so much bulk system capacity. You know, all the regional fires in both Southern California and Northern California have led to huge uh, disruption, um, bankruptcy, uh, and then the regulatory environment, decarbonization. And so really what we're seeing he, here in the middle of the market, again, is more microgrids. These are small projects. We can combine uh, natural gas engines with uh, heat recovery steam generators, solar and battery, kind of an update of what was done in the 90s, which is terrific. And so what you can see is because you need uh, uh, and, you know, and then minus one, you have to overcapitalize these projects um, because you must run. Um, you put too many assets on the ground, uh, but that's fine. You know, you replace the gas with solar when you have it. You use the batteries for balancing resource. And then we, you know, again, we could get PPAs on, on those projects. And those typically, you know, like all of the off takes these days, they're more like 10 years as opposed to 20 years. That's fine. As I said, we're overcapitalized. So when we're not providing electricity or steam, we can trade the uh, excess. So this is the excess of electricity that we can generate. So again, it's a little, little bit complicated strategy, a lot of expertise to execute on this. Our first investment is in the New York City-based developer. We love this. This uh, we'll give you the rationale on the next page. We like this developer. They have been in business for about 12 years now. Uh, they've uh, developed in upstate New York and New York City. Most of them live in New York City. Um, they have previous uh, experience in New York City with cell towers upstate uh, solar and uh, wind. They've done international uh, development. What we like here is uh, scale. Um, they have a, 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 a large pipeline uh, of interconnects. Um, we have already have a handful of awards in what's called the non-wire solution uh, in New York City, as, as well as my sort of bridge incentives. And um, uh, they are well connected. What's interesting is that this uh, team is composed of a business person, an architect, engineer, lawyer, and finance person. And uh, with, within that team, then, they are uh, highly uh, connected to uh, fire department of York, which you need, department of buildings, Con Ed, and all the community boards. This is a really, really tough market to develop in. The market originated in 2014. There is not a single battery project operational in New York City yet. Um, what was our investment rationale? Well, they're well positioned. We couldn't find anyone as well positioned as them. We looked at the queue. We have all their queue positions. 
Uh, we, uh, uh, we love uh, Con Ed. We know that, that resiliency and reliability is key. Just last week, as a matter of fact, Con Ed was forced to call over 100,000 apartments in Queens to tell them they were about to lose power or there could be brownouts. We we're in the middle of a, of a super hot July streak. You know, this is our third or fourth day in the mid-90s. Um, New York City, super high barriers to entry, like I said, no battery projects yet. And New York City, just sort of giving you perspective again why we like this, New York City is a 16 gigawatt peaking market. Um, while there are plenty of projects in uh, upstate New York, most of the power for New York City has come from the north and the west. Most of the coal plants, or I think all the coal, are shut down at this point. Indian points going down to 2,000 megawatts. Most of what's uh, feeding New York now are high voltage DC lines. New York has a big incentive program for offshore wind, uh, but none of that is in New York City. So when you have a 16 megawatt market, it's great to be right where the demand is, and that's why we like this. So even if there's hundreds, of megawatts developed, a thousand megawatts developed, you'll still be extremely short capacity in the market. We like the balanced risk reward ratio. What do we mean by that? I mean, the state has provided incentives to develop in New York. There are grants, uh, there is a feed in tariff, the standard offer contract with for summer capacity. So, Con Ed owns your capacity. Uh, for uh, the three summer peaking months, but we could trade the market um, for the other nine months, you know, subject to FERC rules. And like I said, that's what we like. We could get our base returns through this 10 year standard offer or feed and tariff type contract. They get resiliency, they get to call it in the periods when they need it, when they see blackouts and brownouts coming. Um, there is a big reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, all good. This year, we expect to have uh, 10 to 9 projects funded. So um, we uh, should have uh, uh, hopefully about 25 to 30 megawatts operational in New York City between May and June 2021. We're actually moving towards uh, all, all the capitals available. Like I said, the plants are in place. Uh, by the way, we're doing everything pretty much all equity to start, but we might get a little bit of help from the Green Bank. No one's mentioned that before, but uh, um, the, uh, of all the non-traditional lenders, some of the states have Green Banks to help promote uh, investment in non-traditional asset classes. Um, so in summary, uh, this is my last slide, what's our uh, equity investment criteria, opportunity to scale, so our next investment is in Texas. We like the Texas market, really liquid. We get we can put hedges in place. We have some assets we'll be investing in immediately this year for again, summer 2021 operation, but we can scale that out as a developer with a fairly large pipeline. That was true in New York and in any of the investments we're making in either pipelines or developers, we're looking for that ability to scale uh, we like to support a regulatory environment, and there are others. These are the four we picked because these are all markets in transition. I didn't talk about Ontario uh, in detail, but it's much like Texas. All the wind comes from the west and the north. Everyone lives in all the industry from the south and the east. So rather than uh, reconduct all those lines, the IESO has put uh, rules in place and more will come in place this year to support battery development. That's sort of what happens in Texas, you know, where uh, three gigawatts of wind in the west to the east, you know, it's highly volatile, at least a gigawatt moving to five gigawatts of solar. In Texas, the curve developing, so high volatility. The, um, the uh, uh, ERCOT has put in a new market to deal with the volatility that's in the ancillary services, but really great energy market also, a very deep, very liquid, second largest market in the US. Third, uh, experienced development team. We, uh, we only want to uh, work with 
developers that know what they're doing because we're investors. And while we co-develop, we bring our expertise, we bring our context, that's not our job. The developers have to de develop, so we want to make sure that they are sophisticated, understand their business, and, and there is not a lot of uh, capital drag. Um, mature pipeline, we don't have, we want any, any, you know, black holes. So we don't want, we don't do greenfield development, but it's fine if that's far out. And then, as I said previously, balance risk reward ratio. And for us, that means hedging or contracting a portion of the assets and, uh, and being able to get our merchant upside. With that, I will turn it back over to Kevin uh, and for opening up to the Q&A. Uh, actually, Kevin, are, can you hear me? Yes, I can. This is okay. So this is Richard. So, actually, right before the Q and A, we were going to do some directed questions, sort of following up on this, and then we'll have the Q and A. Um, there awesome. were a few. There were a few items I, I believe, I failed to mention. Um, one, uh, Jeff Bishop is also a board member of the Energy Storage Association, so I wanted. I, can't remember what I said when I introduced him, so uh, no doubt I forgot that. Um, and also, so for the audience here in Utah, or actually there, since I'm not over there, uh, for the audience there in Utah, um, he is one of the best resources I think you could have for understanding how projects work, get developed, and are financed. So uh, I would uh, feel free to offer his services and insights to you. Um, secondly, um, at the tail end of my presentation, I have a number of slides on uh, resources supporting energy storage from the Department of Energy. So we'll make sure to uh, send that out, I guess, afterwards. Um, another thing I had, uh, uh, there was another product that we can share. Uh, there was the, uh, the uh, best practice guide from uh, the Advancing Contract and Energy Storage Working Group. Um, I was able to get about 70 different groups together and put together a 315-page uh, report on, you know, like 10 or 15 pages on 30 different segments of project development to give everybody a little bit better insight on storage. And all the panelists here were incredibly helpful and critical in getting that done. So that's another resource we can provide. Um, what I'm going to do now is ask each one of them sort of a, a directed follow-up kind of question, and then um, we'll have one maybe that's, uh, then we'll have one question that uh, is sort of open, that's a little bit more specific for Utah, and then uh, we'll open up to the Q&A. So I guess in that order, um, Troy, a, a lot of interest has grown you know, for the hybrid storage plant. How does the inclusion of storage as part of a hybrid storage system, uh, as a part of a hybrid system, change the outlook for financial institutions on reviewing a possible investment? Uh, essentially, it makes the uh, system more valuable in many cases. So, uh, like I said previously, it makes the system more dispatchable, allows the developer, need be, to have access to some of the debt side because it's contracted revenue. Um, and in the case of existing assets like thermal, there is a way to um, add energy storage to hybridize it to make the asset uh, more flexible, more able to go down to P equals zero and um, extend the life of an asset that's oftentimes still on an um, uh, accelerated um, depreciation schedule. So if you're going to hybridize, we're seeing a lot of our utility partners hybridizing very large, um, very large thermal assets to get them to operate more like peakers and, um, you know, extend the life of those assets. So, thanks. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, actually, Jeff. So, looking at, you know, the financing for energy storage, how it's evolving. One of the things you had highlighted the example of Texas of, is the flexibility. And as the, the market itself changed, you were able to uh, 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 change how that operation. So what is your expectation for 
how the market for operating these systems will evolve. And I guess really is focusing on valuing or, or how to compensate for that flexibility and the market, some kind of market structures that help you monetize that flexibility. What, 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 what makes that more helpful for you to monetize the flexibility and then be able to make a more robust project? Yeah, so um, there's going to be a lot of different business models for energy storage. And uh, so people are going to be approaching it from, um, you know, directions of doing a solar plus storage model where you're effectively just trying to, you know, push back the peak to the evening ramp. Uh, for companies like mine that we're focused on the standalone storage market, where uh, we may have a primary use case, like in the case of a non-wires alternative that we did for New York uh, for distribution deferral. Uh, you know, during the summer peak hours, we reduced their load on a distribution line by two megawatts. And then outside of that, uh, we operate in the wholesale market. And so just from a financing perspective, it just requires a you know, sophisticated counterparty that understands storage understands what it can do, what it can't do, um, what revenues are, are possible uh, versus, you know, what revenues uh, consultants may tell you are possible. <laughs> and, uh, you know, to, to just have flexible flexibility around that. Um, as far as I'm concerned, as long as we cover our debt service, uh, we, we should not be having limits around uh, how we operate the project. And uh, that, that requires a, a lot of conversations with uh, lenders in order to get them comfortable. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Scott, you talked a little bit about the performance. So how does performance of those systems affect, uh, reflect the, or I'm sorry, impact or affect the bankability of a project and its, and its revenue potential? So um, I briefly covered that. So the things that you have to understand, it's talking about a performance of a piece of technology um, is that your life is not met if the efficiencies aren't maintained of the technology, um, your financial performance will degrade. And the same can be said uh, when I touched over design for end of life, it also, um, when these battery systems are sold, uh, people have to reflect on whether that capacity that's being sold to them is the beginning of life capacity or is it the end of life capacity? And if, you're, if you wanna have a performance guarantee without augmentation, you'd have to have a substantially more beginning of life capacity. Some of these battery systems end of life could be 80% initial capacity, even down to 60% initial capacity. So if you start off with, let's say you needed one megawatt hour um, for the system to be functional, but you start off with one megawatt hour, at the end of life at 60%, you'd only have 600 kilowatt hours. Uh, so, I mean, so 6,000, but uh, so the thing is, is that we have to take into consideration of what we're trying to do um, before we do it. It's a, it's a classic 101 of uh, product design. Uh, understand the requirements before you specify, and then you'll understand what the spe specification should be. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah. And Alan, um, you, you talked about how you were, um, but, you know, I, I guess the question is, how do lenders get comfortable with new technologies like storage, understanding that batteries are all not the same, applications are all not the same. So how do you get comfortable fitting these technologies in certain applications and understanding how reliable they will be for, to, you know, to pay you back? <laughs> really, uh, really good uh, question, Richard. Um, each one of the applications we're looking at are really different and have different configurations, uh, different duration, different batteries. So New York City, um, we have decided uh, uh, to go to the uh, batteries, right? It's uh, and why? Because, you know, FDNY is so clearly the long haul intent. Uh, it could take over a year to get you know, uh, approval uh, for batteries. But we know because we have talked to them last year that they already gotten approval for their modules. And so you know, putting, putting a system together around that is much faster. Uh, but we'll 
more traditional uh, batteries in, in excess. And we'll go with combined solar and batteries in California. So, so really, uh, you know, all of us, and I'm, you know, I, uh, I guess you call a reformed engineer, but, you know, so we have all different backgrounds, right? Where I'm an engineer that went into finance and, uh, and uh, early in my career, Sarah has more of a, of, of a trading background. And so it, the specific application really drives the optimal technology and the choice of technology. And, and that has to fit into the market paradigm. That's why your all your charts were so telling and, and exactly right, because you, you really have to do all of that. And then we will hire outside market consultants to help us, uh, trading floors to talk to, uh, uh, engineering firms to uh, analyze uh, systems. You know, they're not all just putting down batteries to serve Edison. That isn't what we do, right? We're really very applications driven. Okay, great. Thank you. Now, um, and I guess, so for everyone, um, some questions a little bit more specific on Utah. Um, and I, I, I guess also, Mike, I, I you know, please, uh, Mike Ducker, I mean, you know, please feel free to um, add in something here, and then we'll be moving also into um, the Q&A. So I guess maybe, um, so what are some strategic advantages Utah has for deploying energy storage? And maybe what are some typical, typical barriers for markets like, like Utah when looking to introduce storage? Um, and I, if you want to go in the same order or, or just whoever wants to pipe up first. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm yeah. happy to jump in there. Um, Mike Ducker here. And uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, first and foremost, I think one of the uh, things is we look at Utah and, and both geographically and geologically blessed in that, you know, when we look at the West and its goals to decarbonize, you're pretty much right, right dead smack middle of uh, uh, the Western states. And so <clears throat> when we think about some of the high voltage transmission infrastructure coming into and out of the state that go to adjoining states, uh, again, our, our project there, at least looking at um, you know, using hydrogen as energy storage, uh, the salt uh, caverns that are, are there in Delta, Utah that we're developing, um, you know, overall infrastructure access, rail, highway, all that is, you know, I think important as we think about these bigger energy projects. And again, particularly on the transmission piece, um, you know, overall, I think it's been a, a extremely well uh, uh, well received area in regards to you know working with uh, policymakers and regulators around you know even just down to the state agencies and whatnot um, as we get to uh, local agencies too. Uh, you know, trying to develop these projects. So I think uh, you know really a lot of excitement, a lot of interest in, in trying to progress. Uh, you know, some of these you know cleaner techs, uh, particularly energy storage in the state. Um, you know, barrier wise, I think the, you know, the only challenge is, uh, while it's great for supporting maybe some of the other neighboring states, you know, Utah doesn't necessarily have quite the same aggressive targets uh, as some of the neighboring states. I think that is, you know, items that have been proposed to be changed and are under consideration. But, uh, you know, when we look at, um, you know, the need, again, I go back to my presentation on the need for energy storage, a lot of it does come down to, you know, supporting the, the deeper decarbonization goals and integration renewables. So absent that, you know, that's, you know, clearly a need for a market signal there. So, um, you know, that's an area I think that, that further can, can be looked at. But, you know, aside from there, uh, I think, again, the state's uh, in a great position to support uh, even a lot of the neighboring states and actions that are underway. Yeah, when I, when I look, this is Jeff Bishop, when, when I look at, uh, you know, Utah just geographically, so you have the bulk of the population, the bulk of the power demand uh, all in one corridor uh, in the valley. And uh, you combine that with uh, both the Utah associated municipal power systems, uh, as well as Rocky Mountain Power, clearly having a transition to a uh, you know, lower carbon future. And then it just becomes a question on how's that all going to work. And so, uh, really, in order to be able to get you know the power in uh, where you need it and be able to store it for uh, whenever it's, it's truly needed, uh, you know there, there will be batteries that will be all up and down the valley. Uh, Rocky Mountain Power has had success so far, uh, both with a uh, distributed demand response uh, using batteries in residential areas, um, as well as on a pilot project at the end of a radio line, uh, you know, for, for distribution support. 
And so we're going to be seeing more like that just all over the state, uh, just in areas that are relatively weak electrically. But uh, really the, uh, you know, primary movers is, uh, you know, we're, we're an economy that's heavily dependent on the mountains, heavily dependent upon the mountains still having snow. And so as we continue the evolution into carbon free, um, there will be a lot more batteries in Salt Lake City, Park City, uh, Orem, Down in Provo, uh, you know, all over uh, will have to be happening as part of that transition. Um, and if there's somebody else, otherwise, um, I can open it up. I can turn it back over to Kevin, who can manage the Q and A with the audience. Now, this is uh, Troy Miller. Just you know, oh. creating creating the market signals for developers like Jeff to be able to to capitalize on the flexibility associated with energy storage and making the process for interconnecting these new types of resources um, less, um, you know, less complicated and less cumbersome. Those are the two things that I would say. Thank you. Um, Alan or Scott, otherwise, uh, sorry for, Thank you, uh, Troy. So, um, Scott, Alan, are you, do you have something or do you want to just go to the q and I think starting the Q&A, just the only suggestion I have is to uh, not hold a legacy bias when you're looking at energy storage systems. Be open to new technologies and just make sure that you do your best due diligence in validating those technologies. That's all my, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I, I, just, I, I would just like to add that, um, Regulators pay, play a huge role. Uh, we've found in our uh, investing and you know providing support, like a, as I have said in my presentation, support environment, and that is really an evolution. I mean, New York is now six years into, and um, New York's isolated because New York ISO is a, is a state as well as its own its control area, and so um, what we're uh, finding now being as a uh, as as an investor is there's a constant evolution between what happens at the federal level, what happens at the state level uh, with regard to, um, you know, operating in the markets, but also how the state can, can help uh, promote uh, investment is I think absolutely uh, critical. Like I looked at Utah side, I know they, they have a fast start uh, with their objectives and, but um, there's, some advantages to trailing some of these other states that sort of fumbled around a little bit and, and, and figured out, you know, how, how to promote development and investment. Great. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, if there's uh, some Q&A to manage, I'll turn this over to you. Yes, absolutely. And uh, thank you, Richard, for leading the discussion there. And thank you for all the uh, responses there uh, from our speakers. That was uh, wonderful. Um, so I understand uh, Howard Passell has a, a question for uh, the panelists. Uh, so Howard, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself uh, and ask away. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, just first, let me just say thanks to Richard for organizing such a terrific panel and to all the panelists, I really appreciate uh, this session, it was great. And I actually have three questions and I don't want to take up the whole Q&A period. So let me uh, pitch it back to you, Kevin. If there's other folks with questions, let them ask. And then if we have time, I'll ask the questions that I have. Okay, thanks. All right, that sounds good, Howard. Um, all right, well then uh, at this time, I'd like to open this up to the audience. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, address our, our speakers with your question. All right, well, um, I guess with that, Howard, if you wanna go ahead and just kick off with your questions, we can, we can get the uh, Q&A rolling then. Okay, well, I have a couple, one question that's, that might be too far down in the weeds, but I'll just ask them all three at once. Um, Richard, can you say a word, not a lot, about 
a levelized cost of storage? And what are the assumptions that go into it since energy storage has got so much variability with regards to the way it's used, energy in, energy out, cost, and so on? Um, if you would say a word about how that, how you've been, how you think of that and how you calculate it and what do you think might be the weaknesses with regards to that as a metric? Um, Jeff, you mentioned that um, the energy storage in the Permian Basin is now being applied to uses other than the uses that it was originally designed for. And I wonder if you know uh, how well those systems are adapting to these new uses or if uh, they're finding that the batteries were designed for one use and now are being applied to something else and the fit isn't perfect. And then I have this uh, much bigger tech question for everybody on the panel and really everybody in general. What do you think are the chances that the energy storage marketplace is going to look the same in 10 years or 15 years or that it will be very different? And if it's going to be very different, you know, how is it going to be very different? And my thoughts about that very briefly are, you know, right now the energy storage market is booming in short-term energy storage, lithium-ion. And what are the chances that in 10 or 15 years, lithium-ion will be a niche and, you know, hydrogen will be the big player or, or any, you know, what do you think about any of that? So I'll, I'll let it go at that. Thanks, everybody. It's been a really great and informative session. Okay. This, this is Richard. I'll, uh, run through quick. So, um, so in my past, uh, if you're familiar, I uh, with the Lazard levelized cost of storage, I helped with uh, with uh, the one, two, and three. I did all the cost the system cost modeling. Um, one w one thing I would say about levelized cost of storage or LCOS is that it is it is in is very application specific. So. You, so basically, again, going back to that one point uh, that I made about when you are trying to compare these things, because there are multiple points of flexibility, you have to be very specific about your question. So a levelized cost of storage if it is good to compare different technologies for a specific use case, but it, and, and that can be useful maybe sort of from a economic point of view but if you're looking at it from an investment point of view you know the only way you're able to compare all those is to then hold the flexibility solid so um yeah, basically you know it, from a customer's point of view if you have a very specific need an lcos could show you which technology would be least cost for that but it's not a good way to figure out if you're a developer which project I want, which technology or design I want to design a return. So again, it, it, it's useful, but you have to understand the question uh, and the perspective from where it's coming. Uh, Jeff, I think you were next. Yeah, we uh, went, went out for an RFP uh, for the projects in West Texas, assuming the worst case scenario. So we assumed that we'd be cycling them three times a day. And uh, during the absolute peak of uh, whenever the congestion was the worst, we, we were actually were cycling them three times a day, uh, two and a half to three times. And so now that uh, there's, there's no longer that congestion such that we, we need those cycles in order to maximize revenues, uh, that the batteries are doing just fine. Uh, in general, the entire industry uh, tends to undersize uh, HVAC. And so hence, you know, that's, that's something that you, you learn uh, by, by doing uh, the thermal management, thermal calculations around them are super fascinating. Um, and, and then as far as how the entire industry is gonna look in the future, um, I see this probably more going uh, the data uh, storage route than uh, anything else. And so if you're building a giant data server for Facebook or Google or AWS or what have you, um, it, you know darn well that you're going to swap out all of your servers in three to five years. And so, uh, but you still have a, a tremendous amount of value just from the hard assets that are there, uh, the structures, the interconnect, uh, the educated workforce around it, et cetera. And so uh, batteries ultimately will be something similar. Um, I have no idea how these are all going to work 10, 15, 20 years from now. Uh, we have the best consultants we can that, you know, tell us based on our use case what that'll look like. 
But uh, in reality, uh, you know, as long as the batteries still have their declining cost curve, and uh, if you combine that with, you know, physical infrastructure already in place, uh, it gives you a lot more optionality for the future. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about Permian also since I'm working with some developers out there. And what's interesting is that drillers and pumping stations have a great deal of variability. And so, without, again, getting into all the configuration, because it's fairly complicated, there's a way to use produced gas and use batteries to stabilize the pumping station and lower the overall cost of delivery. So it's sort of like it's forming like a little microgrid. And that variability is caused by, you know, it depends on the depth, the depth of the drill, uh, but it's generally because of produced water. And so the batteries serve a totally different function there because really you're, you're using the gas engines for power production, but you need some balancing and you can't run your engines up and down so quickly. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you, Alan, Jeff, um, and um, for those responses. We have uh, one last question before we'll wrap up. Uh, Masood uh, Pravania from the University of Utah has a question for uh, the speakers. So, Masood, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, yeah, thank you, Kevin, and uh, um, uh, this is a great. Uh, uh, this was a great session. I really liked it. And so I have a question for Michael uh, uh, about the hydrogen and specifically about different uh, applications and different uh, uh, revenue streams that could be uh, brought up to the uh, to the hydrogen project, specifically the one that uh, that uh, Mitsubishi is looking at in uh, Delta Utah. That's a great project, and I would like to know if, like, uh, what kind of revenue streams could be imagined for that, for, uh, like, and uh, specifically uh, how, uh, like, a hydrogen project uh, and, and resilience applications for that could be evaluated for a hydrogen project. Yeah, th thanks for the question, and, and, a, and a great question at that. So, um, you know, our focus here when I discussed today was around hydrogen and uh, you know, it, it's opportunity as energy storage supporting the power sector. Um, you know, one of the great benefits or flexibility pieces of hydrogen is its ability to decarbonize other verticals. And so when we think about uh, transportation or, um, you know, even data centers or, you know, going towards uh, certainly heavy industrial facilities, manufacturing and high heat, where you, you can't electrify those industries, uh, that's where, where hydrogen can play certainly a great role. Uh, you know, I think one of the great analogies, and again, I, I don't want to pitch hydrogen as the silver bullet here. Uh, it's hydrogen and batteries that, that are important. And, you know, transportation is another great example. In transportation, just like the power sector, we see short duration with lithium ion batteries, longer duration with hydrogen. It's pretty much the same in maybe transportation where short duration, i.e., you know, your residential vehicles and, you know, your, your light duty vehicles, maybe are better served by, you know, battery type of solutions compared to, you know, long haul, heavy haul vehicles that are traveling thousands of miles, you know, over the span of, uh, you know, a few days or a few weeks, uh, better served by hydrogen. So it's, I think, uh, identifying those different use cases and opportunities, uh, you know, across the energy storage spectrum is important, again, not just in the, the power sector, but in these other areas. And so, you know, I think we're excited and we, we see some opportunities already starting to come to fruition uh, for hydrogen to help decarbonize other verticals. Um, that said, I think one of the best opportunities for hydrogen is, um, or at least one of the best scaling opportunities for hydrogen uh, is in the power sector in the near term. That's where you've got these just really huge demands uh, in, in scaling the power industry with hydrogen. The cost downs we'll get there can then flow down to a lot of these other verticals uh, as we uh, you know, see the similar cost downs that we've seen across, you, know, you name it, solar, wind, even lithium ion batteries. Um, lithium ion batteries, arguably the reverse, the, the transportation and you know, consumer electronics brought down their, their costs, and now it's benefiting the power sector. Conversely, hydrogen, probably the cost will come down thanks to the power sector and will support other industries like, like transportation. Thank you, Michael. Excellent. Well, um, with that, uh, I'd like to conclude today's uh, webinar on uh, energy storage finance.
and thank our speakers and presenters today. So a uh, thank you to uh, Michael Ducker, Richard Baxter, Jeff Bishop, Troy Miller, Scott Daniels, and Alan Dash, as well as I would like to acknowledge and thank um, our uh, partners at the Department of Energy's Office of Electricity Energy Storage Program and uh, Dr. Imre Zhuk for providing funding for this series, as well as the support from Sandia National Laboratories, Pacific Northwest National Laboratories, Mustang Prairie Energy, Quanta Technology, and the University of Utah's Utah Smart Energy Laboratory. Uh, the presentations from today's session will be shared uh, later today. And I would like to um, thank those of you for attending and encourage you to register for the next webinar, um, the Energy Storage Policy Development and Regulatory Issues session on August 5th uh, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. So thank you and everyone have a great day. Thank you.